so it's a great pleasure to, to welcome our next speaker, uh, Mark Casida. Uh, so Mark is a, a theoretical chemist uh, based in Grenoble. Uh, he's a world expert in um, excited state uh, theory, uh, as well as applications. And uh, uh, given the, the broad spectrum of, of topics that we have uh, for this workshop, uh, we thought it'd be very interesting to, to hear from Mark about his perspectives on, um, on the role of excited state calculations uh, in, in biology. Okay, so uh, the floor is yours, Mark. Okay, thank you, Ali. Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to have been invited to participate. Uh, so far, I've been able to see uh, three talks and um, I've been learning a lot. This is not really my area. Um, I happen to have, well, my father and his father uh, were professors, um, university professors, as was my uncle, uh, but they were all biologists and I'm not a biologist. I am somebody who is interested in quantum chemistry methods. So I wasn't quite sure whether there hadn't been some mistake in inviting me to this talk, to give a talk, um, but I was assured that somehow I fit in. And so that's why I'm sure the, um, the list of topics includes spectroscopy, excited state dynamics in biology. Um, because I'm coming a little bit from outside the field, I'm going to try and keep this fairly general. So I thought I would begin by just how we think about photochemistry. This is a, a, an example of old data for a small molecule reaction. You shine light and you get various products um, in various yields. You can then try to do mechanistic experiments and try and write down uh, Lewis representations of how you think the mechanism goes. But if you really want to understand, then Woodward and Hoffman said we should think in terms of quantum mechanics and orbitals. Um, the Woodward-Hoffman way of thinking about things works very well for the ground state. It doesn't turn, it turns out it doesn't work as well for excited states. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, excited states um, actually involve not just orbitals, but configurations built up of orbitals. So in the simplest case uh, of a two electron, two orbital model, you would have to build singlet and triplet states. You would build their excitation energies. And then you would then look at, uh, start to think about, uh, how the different ground and excited state energies vary with all the nuclear coordinates of your system and those are the potential energy surfaces. Then in modern, in the modern approach to photochemistry, you would be thinking about potential energy surfaces. You would be investigating various pathways uh, to find photochemical funnels, ways to get from surfaces, one surface to the another. And you would think about doing dynamics. And then ultimately you would want to take that and maybe go back to the orbital models and go back to the Lewis structures so that you could talk with experimentalists. Um, I want to give you some more examples of what I mean by photochemistry because what I mean by photochemistry is more general than what some people mean by photochemistry. And I think you'll appreciate why this is the case. Uh, my photochemistry includes photophysics. That is where you excite a molecule A, you make an excited state, and when it rela re relaxes, it returns to the same uh, molecule without any broken bonds, without any bonds broken, without any bonds formed. So this includes, for example, um, uh, luminescence like in the green fluorescent protein. You can also have real photochemistry where bonds are broken and made during the photochemical process. So you return to a different structure than you started with. And one canonical example is in vision where you have the cis-trans isomerization in uh, 
retinol. Uh, if you turn the photochemistry backwards so that your products become reactants and they come together, make an excited state molecule, and that falls apart, and, and that gives a, uh, a product in emitting light, then you have chemiluminescence, and there are lots of examples, fireflies, glow worms, etc., in biology. One thing which is probably less appreciated uh, and which first turned up as I best as best I recall in biological applications is that there are reactions that look like they ought to follow photochemical reactions. They have the same reactants, the same products, but which are thermal reactions. Light is not involved. So sometimes this is called photochemistry in the dark or photochemistry without light. Finally, and I think this is very relevant for um, biological applications. Um, we, uh, there, we need to think somehow in terms of localized excitations or excitons. These can be uh, energy transfer excitons. These can be charge transfer excitons. They can be real because you're exciting part of the molecule and the energy transfer and the charge transfer is going throughout the molecule or they could be fictitious simply because our mind is not capable of understanding what's going on unless we're able to break the molecule into subsystems and uh, understand how they're interacting. Okay. Um, my specialty over the years has been density functional theory and especially time dependent density functional theory. Um, around 1995, um, density functional theory was becoming very impressive uh, to ab initio quantum chemists. They were, they were afraid that they were about to be buried by the low cost and efficiency of this method, but there, there was a way out. And that was, it was believed that density functional theory could not handle excited states. Um, this slide was uh, a slide from somebody else's presentation. Uh, that a student gave to me. Um, and this shows uh, two of the people who've helped to show that you can get excited states from DFT. Uh, Hardy Gross that you saw together with Eric Runga uh, proved a theorem, um, which basically says that analogous to what happens in ordinary uh, density functional theory. Um, in the time dependent case, the external potential, that is the, the potential seen by the electrons, uh, is determined by the time dependent charge density. And this helps to justify time dependent current charge equation. So practically, this means you take your ordinary familiar current charge equation and you turn it into a time-dependent equation. And if you do that, um, the, the naive way that most people will do it, you have time-dependent DFT in the adiabatic approximation or what I call conventional time-dependent DFT. And if you worry about what is missing, then you need to worry about uh, what's in equation three, a exchange correlation action. But we won't go into that. We'll stick primarily to conventional time-dependent DFT, where the exchange correlation potential is more or less what you think it is. OK, we can get excited states from that by using uh, response theory. So what we do is we look at the response of the dipole moment to a time-dependent electric field, uh, which is a model of a photon. And from that, you can uh, show that the poles, that is the singularities of the um, polarizability, give you the excitation energies and the residues give you the intensities in your absorption spectrum. And this is the famous sum over states theorem in, in optical physics. Um, a quarter of a century ago, I made that practical by writing down some equations that looked like the random phase approximation equations that are common in uh, um, 
quantum chemistry software. And this meant that it could be implemented very quickly in both quantum chemistry software and quantum physics software. Uh, since then, it has been tested and we know where it works best. Time-dependent DFT works best when DFT works well for the ground state without any symmetry breaking. It works best for low energy excitations of dominant single excitation character. It works best when there's not too much charge transfer. So I will be talking about that a bit more in this talk, especially. Uh, and the excitations are reasonably uh, localized. So that's the safe place. The place that interests me is the red zone, the danger zone, where everything breaks down and you need to develop the method further. The place that where most users actually apply the method is the blue zone, where there's a reasonable risk. They want to go outside the safe zone, but they don't want to go really into the danger zone. Um, the method is fairly simple in uh, its use, uh, and that is one reason people like it, and also because it works well enough that they can treat many problems that they cannot treat with other methods. Something that is also important uh, from the point of view of this talk is that density functional theory has an approximation to it, uh, which is called density functional type binding. It looks like DFT. It takes methodology from some empirical theories uh, and it fits DFT um, and it can be developed in line along lines that look very, very much like DFT and it should behave like DFT uh, whenever possible. It can be extended to time dependent DFT. Okay. Uh, Murphy, who is an aeronautics engineer said, as we all know, if anything could possibly go wrong, it will. And so you, as an aeronautics engineer, he needed to try and keep things from going wrong. One of the things that goes wrong is that charge transfer excitations uh, with the typical functionals are, can be underestimated by huge amounts by one or two electron volts. And this was pointed out by, by Drew Weissman and Head Gordon actually, it was pointed out earlier, but their paper is particularly clear. So that's why they get credit. Um, we can see often when there is going to be a problem within a time-dependent DFT calculation by using some sort of criterion as a measure of charge transfer. The most popular is the, the lambda criterion, uh, which says that for small vol values of lambda, you should have a problem. Uh, you should expect a problem with um, underestimated charge transfer excitation energies. If that's the case, what you need to do is use range-separated hybrids, these are special density functionals where you divide uh, the Coulomb repulsion between the electrons into a short range part and a long range part. The short range part is handled by uh, density functional theory. Uh, as Cohn once said, um, uh, electron correlation is uh, nearsighted. Uh, that's not entirely true. And that's why uh, the long range part is also there and needs to be handled by um, wave function techniques such as uh, techniques using exact exchange. Okay, now I'm going to talk about some applications that we have done. It's going to be a little bit superficial. I hope it will be clear, however. Um, one of the applications is remotely inspired by photosynthesis. I'm not going to go through all the details of photosynthesis, but here we have the sort of main structure of um, uh, the most basic uh, parts of the working units in photosynthesis. And chemists will ask themselves, can I make something that's not photosynthesis that will do something else uh, through bio-inspired chemistry that will, that will somehow look like the, the, the photosynthesis molecule, but will do something else. And one of the popular ways to do this is um, begins with 
the magic of uh, this trispiperidine ruthenium uh, complex, which has uh, a long-lived excited state because of phosphorescence, but it also has easy charge transfer. And so then you can start building something uh, with, with chemical wires um, and uh, a chemical reaction center that starts to look like your photosynthetic uh, uh, unit in biology. The problem is when you start to put on those chemical wires, you can interfere with the excitation lifetime and you can lose some of your desirable properties of the, uh, the ruthenium complex. Uh, so what you want is to be able to maintain the um, long luminescence lifetime. And we know from studies of uh, trispiperidine in particular, that what can happen is a quenching of the excited state uh, due to an avoided crossing of the um, triplet metal ligand charge transfer state, which uh, phosphoresces with a triplet metal centered state. And so one of the things that, that we wanted to do, and I should mention that this has a close link with ICTP it, uh, through the, um, uh, the help that we've gotten via the um, African School for Electronic Structure uh, Methods and Applications. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do in, in this project was to understand if we could um, understand the, the barrier height there uh, from uh, orbital energies. And fortunately, there's a bit of a gold mine uh, in this paper where there's about 100 pages of photochemical data, which has been published. And that allowed us to extract not a real barrier height, but an empirical barrier height. And from that, and about 100 uh, uh, calculations on about 100 molecules, uh, Dennis Maguero uh, was able to construct this correlation between our empirical barrier height and our um, uh, an orbital luminescence, orbital based luminescence index based upon the pi star orbital energies of the ligands and the EG orbital energy of the, the ruthenium complex. Um, there are outliers, but what is interesting is that if you focus in on those things that look most like trispiperidine, uh, that is, they're bidentate ligands and they're symmetric so that the both sides look the same, you get the, the blue squares and they lie very much on a line. So what that's telling me is that uh, the other things have other mechanisms and that would be interesting to investigate in the future. Okay. Mark, so get to Mark I had a question. Uh, so yes. how, how did you, what did you extract exactly to get the, 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 the potential energy barrier from the, from the simulations? Okay, we got the potential energy barrier based upon experimental data. Uh, okay. In essence, times measured at room temperature and at 77K, so liquid nitrogen temperature. Okay. And, and that's just a crude estimate um, because there are many things that go on between 77K and room temperature. I see. Uh, even better would be to go and calculate the barrier heights uh, from first principles, and we have an ongoing project that's doing exactly okay. that. But that's actually more time consuming. Yeah, okay, got it. Okay. All right, so I want to tell you now about a project that, um, that, uh, um, well, one day Claudia Filippi called me up and said, Mark, uh, I think we need some help. Um, <laughs> And it led to this very nice work uh, involving her then uh, doctoral student, uh, Omar Valsen. And this is about um, the vision mechanism, the cis-trans uh, isomerization. Uh, and in particular, they were looking at uh, various models that could be treated at a high level. And um, this is a bit of a complicated transparency, so I'll, I'll try to explain it. Um, they discovered 
that the gold standard for analyzing, for modeling this type of reaction, which is the complete active space self-consistent field, the CAS SCF, uh, which had also been used to criticize density functional theory as giving the wrong answer, particularly time-dependent density functional theory giving the wrong answer, was itself giving the wrong answer in the sense that if you put correlation corrections on top of CAS SCF, so either did CAS PT2 or CC2 or even Quantum Monte Carlo, then uh, in fact, your initial relaxation of the excited state in the retinal model uh, involves some single bond rotations that take you down into the minima, which can lead to fluorescence that's actually observed in bacterial uh, rhodopsin. And that turns out to be well described by some density functionals. What is not well described is when you return to the double bond rotation. And that's something that we can't describe at the present time with typical uh, uh, commonly accessible time dependent DFT methods. So they came to me and they said, why? And we looked at the lambda parameter for the, the uh, charge transfer. And we found out that where the lambda parameter is large, so that's on the bottom, then our curves matched the red curves for the CUS PT2 relaxation. Um, and depending upon the functional, uh, it, would, it, it would last for more of the dynamics or less of the dynamics, but it always correlated with the lambda parameter. And that was very, very satisfying. Uh, so we know, understand what's going on. Um, now I wanna talk about excitonic effects. Um, this is one of those papers where uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly proud of what we were able to accomplish, um, but looking uh, back on it, I learned a few things. Yes? Mark, sorry. So we, we, we lost like a, a minute of what you said. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Um, oh, dear. When I was talking about this, did you lose that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just when you started excitonic effects. Oh, okay. So now I want to talk about excitonic effects. Excitonic effects are probably the way that one has to think about biological systems. You need to be able to break it down into smaller systems. Um, in this case, uh, we were looking at excitonic effects for a somewhat different reason. Um, when molecules come together and form aggregates as they do for some dye molecules in solution, that you will see spectral shifts. And these can be understood, uh, and this, this uh, is an example of spectral shifts for um, pentacene in solution, which is the, the blue curve, and in thin films, which is the red curve. Um, and this can be explained in terms of shifts and in terms of certain splittings. And all of that can be explained in terms of what I call Kasha's exciton model. This is a very old theory. He's, it's actually a theory that was presented in Davidov's book on um, excitons in the last chapter. Michael Kasha translated that into English, and it just involves uh, assuming excitations um, in individual molecules and then taking into account the interaction between the two molecules as a perturbation. I'm not going to go through all the equations. I'm just going to say that if you interact uh, an excitation on one molecule with an interaction on another molecule, you get a two by two matrix problem to solve, a configuration interaction problem to solve. And so you get two solutions, which gives a splitting. But on top of that, you can look at, uh, you get information in this model about um, the intensities. Uh, so, you can determine which states are going to be present in the spectrum, which um, states are going to be absent, or which states are going to be bright, which states are going to be dark. And ultimately, that tells you something about how the different molecules are oriented with each other. Now, Kasha's model included energy transfer, but it didn't include charge transfer. So what we did was to generalize it to include charge transfer. Uh, 
At the time the paper was published, I thought we were the only ones who had done that, but now I realize there are other people who had done it as well. And then we were able to look at what is an interesting phenomenon from, from my point of view, and that is where you have excitations of these aggregates and you see no obvious charge transfer, and yet Kasha's model, including charge transfer, modified to include charge transfer, is telling you that there really is charge transfer going on. And it turns out that we could analyze that and we could see for different functionals that indeed the excitations that were associated uh, in, in down here in the, the middle bottom, we could see that the dashed lines that were associated with a charge transfer were underestimated. And then when you put in more Hartree-Fock exchange using some range separated method or just time dependent Hartree-Fock, you would see that the charge transfer excitation increased. So even when you don't see charge transfer, you have to be careful because it might be there in a hidden way. Okay, this brings me to Dynamics, we have a little experience in dynamics. It's not my specialty, uh, minus the electronic structure. Uh, but um, the way to handle larger systems is usually using some mixed quantum classical dynamics. In these methods, the electrons are treated quantum mechanically in the field of the moving nuclei. The nuclei are treated classically. There are essentially two families for doing this. One is Ehrenfest dynamics where we note Ehrenfest theorem, then we note that Newton's laws hold for expectation values. Um, the problem with Ehrenfest dynamics, uh, the advantage is it's simple, the disadvantage of it is that the nuclei are now moving on an average potential energy surface. So it, it's not a, a dynamics which is any longer associated with well-defined electronic state. And it leads to physically incorrect um, results in some instances because it lacks microscopic, it violates microscopic reversibility. The other way to do it is called the surface hopping method. Here, the nuclei move on the potential energy surfaces for well-defined electronic states. You regain microscopic reversibility. You can even, in principle, obtain relative yields for competing products in a chemical reaction, but it's going to be more difficult, even much more difficult to implement. The idea is somehow simple. You, you have a time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation um, for the electrons. At any given molecular geometry, you, at any given time, you have a, a particular molecular geometry, you find the stationary states, you expand your time dependent wave function in the stationary states, and then from the squares of the, the coefficients projected onto each of those stationary states, you get the probabilities of hopping to another surface. In practice, you can't really do that because there is too much hopping. Tully's genius was to figure out a way using a Monte Carlo method to minimize the number of hops to make this feasible. And this is a, a method that's uh, very commonly used. Um, it includes some important details as regarding how you adjust, for example, the nuclear kinetic energies when you hop. But there's another thing which is not a detail, and that is because uh, of the probability aspect, um, you shouldn't read too much information. You should not try to read too much information into a single trajectory you have to do ensemble averages over large swarms of trajectories before you've got something physical. And I think we'll see an example of that. Uh, another thing which I was a bit slow to realize, I didn't realize it fully until uh, last summer, um, was the importance of adding a decoherence correction. Now, what that means is uh, we have a quantum part to our calculation, we have a classical part to our calculation, and that's switching from the quantum part to the classical part is a little bit like uh, what you have in the Copenhagen principle for uh, interpreting quantum mechanics, where you're making a measurement with the classical apparatus of your quantum system. You should get the right, you should 
find that you are moving on the right potential energy surface after you make that quantum measurement. Otherwise, you're over coherent. Ehrenfest method is by definition over coherent because the system is moving on an average potential energy surface and that by definition can't be right except possibly in the crossing region. Tully's method a priori doesn't seem like it would be over coherent, but Tully showed early on that it also has aspects of over coherence, not as much as the Ehrenfest method, but it's still over coherent. And that's because after you go through a crossing region, you have components of your electronic wave function, which um, correspond to the excited state and the ground state, uh, which shouldn't be there when you're far from the crossing region. And so you need to correct that by introducing decoherence corrections. And if you do that in the Ehrenfest method, you get something that looks more like Tully's method. If you do that in Tully's method, you get something that starts to look a little bit more like Ehrenfest method. Okay, let me show you a couple of examples. The first example is the second, to my knowledge, application of uh, the method with time-dependent DFT, uh, just to the, uh, photochemistry of oxyrain, we see the gomer noise mechanism. Uh, we also saw um, other products that correspond to experimentally observed products, which was very satisfying, uh, but we only could run 30 trajectories, so we couldn't get the relative quantum yields. Now I want to go to a case which is not biological, but has some resemblance to biology because we're dealing with a large complicated system. Um, and this has to do with photovoltaics, organic photocells. Uh, we had a student come from the United States to do a, uh, an internship with us and she brought with her this wonderful example. She said, silicon solar cells are like your grandma's uh, crystal. It's really nice, but it's expensive and it's breakable. You also wanna have some Tupperware in your kitchen, uh, which is cheap and versatile. And that's like organic solar cells. So this is a, a niche application, um, which is developing um, quite rapidly. And we wanted to look at one aspect, one tiny aspect uh, in a particularly simple organic solar cell. It's not the most efficient one. And this diagram is showing you how that works. You need a, an electron uh, donor, in this case, pentacene and an electron acceptor, in this case, a C60 or buckyball, um, you need a transparent electrode and you need uh, another electrode on the bottom. The photons come into the transparent electrode and they go to the donor acceptor boundary region where something happens. Uh, there's an excitation, there's charge separation. And we wanted to know if we could model the charge separation with the fewest switches surface hopping method. There are lots and lots of studies of this particular system, both experimentally because you can build it and also theoretically, but there are almost, there are very, very few studies uh, with the fewest switches surface hopping method. So we decided that we would try to study this using the, the simplest model, just one, a molecule of C60, just one molecule of pentacene. And uh, we needed to define observables. So our observables here actually are the total charge on pentacene, the total charge on uh, the fullerene, uh, evaluated from particle and hole charges on each molecule. This corresponds to physically how charges are transferred. Um, but if you have a situation, as represented in this picture, where a hole and a particle are, are transferred at the same time, then there's no net charge transfer. There is charge transfer in Kasha's term, but there's no net charge transfer. That's not something that we're going to see the way we set up the calculation. There were some other things we did that were particular to the, the um, organic electronics model, but uh, we set it up and we ran a swarms of about 100 tra trajectories so we could get ensemble averages. And we did it using time-dependent density functional type binding theory with a long-range correction so we could describe charge transfer. And that involves a parameter 
the the um, uh, the RLC parameter that you will see, uh, and we wanted to understand what was going on in the calculation as we varied that. So first, I want to show you the importance of the decoherence correction. You can either calculate the charge transfer uh, and the energy transfer via um, as, as you have it here from the um, time dependent electronic wave function, or you can uh, try and calculate it from the um, adiabatic wave functions that correspond to each particular potential energy surface, depending upon which is the active potential energy surface. Without the decoherence correction, you get two very different results. With the decoherence correction, you get essentially the same result. So that's just one illustration of why it's very important to include a decoherence correction in these calculations. I'm not going to go through this transparency. This is just showing you that for different values of the range separation parameter, we get different results uh, for the charge transfer and the energy transfer. This summarizes things much better. Here we're seeing the energy transfer and the charge transfer times as a function of the range separation parameter. If we compare with um, experimental estimates uh, of the charge transfer time taken from different systems and also theoretical estimates, then what's physically reasonable is when the range separation parameter is greater than about 10 bore. We can't um, do high quality ab initio calculations for this system for a lot of geometries. We can't uh, do the fewer switch of surface hopping uh, uh, with high quality ab initio methods uh, for this system, but we can do it for one geometry. And for that geometry, we can make a comparison between what we see with this uh, semi empirical method and the um, high quality ab initio calculations, and we can see that we get the right ordering of states, but only when the range separation parameter is larger than about 10 bore. Um, it's interesting to think about what that means. Uh, 10 bore is about the distance between the two molecules, which makes some sort of sense. But on the other hand, if we were doing time-dependent DFT instead of time-dependent density functional type binding, that is TDDFTB, we would expect a much smaller range separation parameter. So this is indicating that there's still some difference between the two methods. Um, that brings me to the end of my talk. I, I hope that I'm not running over. I've, I've been very superficial in some ways. I'm just giving you a glimpse of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I've shown you that we can look at uh, factors uh, that influence um, luminescence lifetimes. I've shown you the importance of describing charge transfer correctly for uh, biological uh, systems and that there are ways to describe it more correctly. Um, and also for um, also the importance of defining charge transfer correctly if you're looking at uh, uh, an exciton model. Uh, I've shown you that we can do dynamics, um, surface hopping dynamics, and I've shown you that we can start to do this for systems that begin to have very large numbers of, of atoms, not as large as the proteins that I've seen up to this point, um, but still large. And we will probably go to systems where we have five pentacene molecules and five C60 molecules. But you could imagine taking this in a biological system, looking at the, the, the important part of the molecule uh, with this semi-classical dynamics, and then having outside of that um, some sort of um, molecular dynamics model um, to describe the, the rest of the biological system. Uh, in fact, the method that's I've seen the most used for biological systems is the Ehrenfest method with time-dependent DFT that's been used to study the green fluorescent uh, protein and also used to study um, DNA damage. Uh, 
This brings me to the end of my talk. I want to thank you. I want to thank the organizers. Um, I'm glad that we can have this workshop. There is one small thing that I do miss from ICTP. And you can see that in the picture. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, for your excellent talk. Uh, and I certainly miss uh, the coffees too at ICTP in these circumstances. Um, OK, very good. So uh, we have uh, time for some questions. Um, OK, we have uh, Uriel. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand. You can ask a question yourself. OK, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was uh, super interesting for me. Uh, I have a, like a, I have, a, in fact, many questions. But one of the questions, which is a general question, is what do you think about, you talk in this, all of the applications that you mentioned are about um, CDFT in the linear regime, in the sense of linear excitation, single excitations. Uh, what do you think, there, there are many, now many experiments that have a, a very, very interesting nonlinear studies. What do you think about the future of linear response to the FT uh, in order to try to tackle uh, this kind of experiments? Okay, that would probably depend on the precise experiment. Um, time dependent DFT can be used in the non-linear regime. You don't have to use linear response theory, or you could use higher order uh, linear response theory, so second order or third order. Um, one of the places that's important is, is in biology in um, spectroscopy, that is uh, two photon spectroscopy. Um, I was surprised uh, when I was looking for um, information about two photon fluorescent spectroscopy to discover that it's one of the most used spectroscopies in biology um, because it is, um, you can um, use low energy photons that can penetrate into uh, biological samples um, in a non destructive way, and there are lots of things in biological samples that will then fluoresce. And that has the additional advantage that um, because the, the light is coming directly from the, the molecules in the biological sample, that you get much increased resolution. So yeah, that, that has, is something that, that has been worked out. Um, I'm sure there are many other examples uh, that, um, that we could use uh, at higher energy, but that's the one that, that uh, came to mind first as probably being the, the most important and existent already implemented application. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, Yavar, please go ahead. Hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for this nice presentation. Uh, Professor Kasida, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is too general. Uh, when we work with these uh, biological molecules, mainly zwitter ionic or anions, uh, we have a large band gap in homo lomo and also uh, we have positive eigenvalues. It seems these uh, LUMO states are unbounded. And this leads uh, to lots of spurious uh, and fictitious excitation and changing exchange correlation, for example, change uh, our results and affect them. There are some uh, suggestions in literature to tackle with this problem, but I'd like to hear from you, what's the best benchmark to check uh, this problem? The, the, the best thing to do right now, 
um, with existent software is to use the range separated hybrids. Uh, they will correct the asymptotic behavior, which will correct your, your eigenvalues. Um, they're not totally a black box. There are things you have to adjust. Um, but they're designed to fix that problem. And uh, another problem is uh, when we use even these uh, range separated exchange correlations, uh, another okay. problem is this uh, the excitation should be described by a lot of uh, unoccupied levels and it makes it difficult to uh, visualize, to show the shape of excited states. And sometimes we have big diffuse orbitals in visualizations. Uh, what's your idea about this? Uh, okay. Um, I'm not sure that there is a, a perfect solution to that. Uh, the one that we often use is to look at uh, natural transition orbitals. So this is a, a sort of a um, canonical rotation of your orbitals to get rid of, to, to simplify as much as possible the analysis. And often that works. Um, but as you go to larger and larger systems, you probably need to use special techniques. And there, um, there are special techniques which I am not as up on as I would like to be. That's on my reading list. Um, there are special techniques that represent all the excitations uh, as a sort of a, a matrix, which is then color coded to show you where you've got um, where the major excitations are, are occurring in space or in your molecule. And, and that's very helpful. Thank you. Adi, uh, can so, I ask one? Uh, well, let, let me, let me uh, add, there's a question in the chat. So let me ask that. Um, so uh, the question is the following. Uh, uh, is the hardy fock potential taken cautiously because it has something to do with the overestimation of charge transfer or some related stuff? The, the um, Hartree-Fock exchange at long distance is taken at long distance uh, because um, because if you think about Koopman's theorem, Koopman's theorem tells you that the Hartree-Fock uh, orbitals, the Hartree-Fock method is set up to describe ionization and electron attachment. And that's charge transfer. And that turns out to be a long distance effect. So Hartree-Fock is somehow correct at long distance. But when you have things that are locally excited and you don't have charge transfer, then you don't want to describe things in terms of ionization and electron attachment. You want to describe things as if the underlying potential hasn't changed very much because the electron density doesn't change very much. And there, DFT works very well. So yeah, I, I, I've given you a, a, a very simplistic, intuitive explanation, I think, of why you want to use Hartree-Fock for charge transfer at long distance, but you still want to keep density functional theory at short distance with its dynamical correlation and its a priori better description of localized excited states. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, there's a question uh, on slide 42. 42. 42, 42. Yes. Uh, the question is, what is the range of the order of time on slide 42? The order of time. Yeah, I guess. So how long, how long, 
there's no time yeah, there, in this yeah. transparency. I think we're talking then about uh, phosphorescence lifetimes. Uh, these go from nanoseconds to microseconds. Okay, thank you. There's an, okay, uh, there's another question from Uriel. Go ahead, Uriel. Thanks. Um, so I, I have a, a, a technical question. When you mentioned this uh, decoherence correction, uh, when used with um, surface hopping, does it help in the preservation of the dead balance or it has nothing to do with it? Does it help in the preservation of, of what? I didn't catch the word. Detailed balance. Detailed balance. Um, it doesn't have to do with detailed balance. It, okay, has okay. To, it um, it's necessary in order to avoid um, artifactual uh, oscillations uh, between states. It's necessary in order to recover um, Marcus theory and the limit that Marcus theory should be valid. Um, it's necessary uh, so that different ways of calculating uh, expectation values are uh, consistent with each other. Um, I think most people who are really deep experts in this area understand this, but that's probably only a tiny, tiny fraction of the people who use these methods. So, um, I I think it's important to get the word out that it is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, uh, well, thank you uh, for the questions. Thank you for your talk, uh, Mark. Uh, and uh, so we'll basically close the morning session and we'll be back at uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So thanks again, uh, Mark, and thank you all. And uh, the first speaker, Max, for today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye-bye. Mark, actually, are you there? Uh, yeah, I yeah. just... No, yeah. so I, I had a, I mean, um, a question for you regarding when you're doing uh, excited state simulations, like the surface hopping in, in the context of biology, um, is so one of the things that happens, of course, is when you when you excite a molecule, and uh, it begins to relax to its its potential energy minimum, it's going there's going to be also a lot of vib uh, vibrational cooling. So the system is going to heat up. Right. And so so you know when you're when you're modeling small clusters, um, there's there's not a heat bath for this energy to go into. Um, and this sort of relates to your last point in your conclusions, which is that, you know, if you couple that with the molecular mechanics force field, then you will, you'll be able to dissipate that heat into, um, into the surrounding environment. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering about what are the artifacts that one has uh, by not al allowing for sufficient degrees of freedom in the system for that vibrational cooling to happen? That's complicated by the time scales that we're dealing with. Most of the interesting uh, photochemical phenomena that we're studying are happening in the order of um, sub picosecond time scales. Okay. Okay, so if it doesn't happen in 100 or 200 femtoseconds, um, then probably something else is going to happen to quench the photochemistry. Mm -hmm. um, that's also about the limit of the calculations that we can do right now. Okay. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that the coupling, the, the, the coupling with the, the vibrational motions with the nuclear motions is still very important. And I think the coupling with the bath is going to be important. And it's going to be important in determining somehow the, the decoherence rate too. Yeah, you can yeah. See that in some of the literature. Um, 
We don't know. Yeah. We don't okay. Know. Okay. I see. I see. I see. We'd like to have the bath in. We know the bath should be in. We know yeah. it's going to affect the decoherence rate, but I don't think we know very much. And we certainly don't have exact calculations against what we compare. Yeah, sir. So, so, so. Makes sense. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So, I guess I'll say goodbye. Thanks a lot, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Max. If you're still there. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Ciao. Okay, perfect. I also need people or or someone else is doing it? I think Sabrina is doing it, right? Sabrina, are you admitting? Uh, yeah, I can do. Wait a second.
it's two o'clock, but maybe we can wait a couple of more minutes. People are coming in right now. So I think that uh, most of the people are here. We have 60 participants and some are still coming. So maybe I will start uh, saying a few words. So good afternoon to everyone and welcome back. My name is Giovanni Bussi and I am one of the co-organizers of this event. Uh, although actually, uh, as you probably guessed, Ali and Angela are those who did really most of the work. Uh, still, I have the pleasure to be the chair for this session, and it's really a pleasure to introduce the first speaker, who is uh, Michele Ceriotti. So uh, I know Michele since a very long time, uh, because when I was a postdoc uh, in the group of uh, uh, Michele Parinello, so big Michele, uh, Michele, small Michele, so Michele Ceriotti, Michele, you know, joined for a PhD. And so we overlap for a few years. And then after that, uh, Michelino went to, uh, for a postdoc in Oxford in the group of Manolopoulos. And then uh, he ended finally with an uh, independent position at the EPFL, where he's now a professor. So uh, Michele will tell us about equivalent representations for uh, atomistic machine learning. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, as well as uh, all the organizers for having me here and all of you for convening here uh, virtually. So um, since I had uh, uh, 30 minutes to give you an um, overview and introduction to machine learning, I thought that rather than giving a big blah blah uh, introduction to everything about machine learning, I would focus on one specific uh, uh, ingredient. And uh, this ingredient is that of the representation. So whatever you want to do with your uh, machine learning model, be it uh, inference, so predicting a potential or properties or whatever, uh, be it classification, dimensionality reduction to be used in accelerated sampling. Uh, in all of these cases, the first uh, and in my opinion, most important step is that of mapping the Cartesian coordinates to your, of your atoms uh, onto some mathematical object that can be a vector, a distance, or a kernel. And uh, the way you perform this mapping is uh, play a crucial role in determining the efficiency of your machine learning scheme. So I thought that I would focus in particular on this aspect of machine learning. So, 
uh, you need to find a way of mapping a structure to a representation. And actually the point is that there is a huge number of different ways of doing it. Uh, you start from the Cartesian coordinates of your atoms, and then these three sort of summarizes uh, applying different transformations, you can get to a very large number of different uh, families of representations. You get SOAP, you get better Parinello symmetry functions, permutation invariant polynomials, sprints. There is a huge zoology, but actually uh, the reason why these are represented in these three is that they are actually very strongly connected with each other. And they are strongly connected with each other because ultimately uh, the requirements that you have from these representations for them to be effective and uh, uh, to, to work well uh, are pretty much always the same. So what do you require for a representation to be an effective way of mapping a configuration of your system onto a mathematical object that you can use for machine learning? So first of all, you have several requirements in how the uh, structures are mapped into this feature space, which is basically is the uh, mathematical space in which machine learning algorithms will operate. So some uh, uh, very fundamental requirements that you have is first of all that your mapping uh, reflects uh, physical symmetries. This means that if you just change the reference system by translating, rotating your structure or permuting the order of the atoms, the mapping should bring you always to exactly the same place. Otherwise, you will have uh, representations that, that basically you have structures that should have exactly the same properties, uh, but have a different representation. And therefore your machine learning algorithm will have to learn that the mapping is basically to something that has exactly the same properties. Second, uh, you want this mapping at the same time to be complete. So this means that if you have two structures that are not equivalent, uh, related to each other by one of these transformations, they should be mapped to different points. Third, you know, since uh, nature dislikes uh, discontinuities, uh, at least at the microscopic scale, um, the mapping should be smooth, meaning that if you smoothly transform one structure into each other, uh, the feature space mapping should also lead to a continuous map. A fourth requirement is that uh, the way you build this representation um, incorporates uh, some ideas of additivity and locality, meaning that if you want to represent a large structure, these should be in a certain sense that we will try to discuss, uh, built as the sum of representations that correspond to chunks of your system. Now, why is this useful and important? Well, because uh, uh, most of the physically inspired models of the properties of molecules and materials uh, are based on a uh, usually atom-centered additive decomposition. So basically you postulate that the property that you want to learn, let's say the potential, can be written as a sum of terms that are attached one way or another to each atom in your system. Now, the point is that for many different families of models, the assumption that she, the target of your regression uh, scheme can be broken down into atom-centered contributions implies that also the way you represent your system, for instance, the feature vector for your structure should be just the sum of feature vectors that describe atom-centered contributions. If you are using a kernel framework, the kernel that you use to compare two structures should just be the sum of kernels that compare individual atomic environments. So why is this important and why is this useful? Well, this is because, and this is the same idea that underlies so many linear scaling electronic structure methods. Uh, the idea is that if you have this additivity, the possibility of decomposing your system into atom-centered environments, then you will be able to train your model on relatively simple systems and then be able to break it, the pieces apart and put them back together into a different form and make predictions 
understand something about systems that are more complex and potentially more interesting than the very simple cases that you use for the training phase. Now, to try and uh, uh, formalize all of these concepts, uh, I have been working uh, uh, together with people in my group and also collaborators outside my group uh, on a formalism to describe uh, a atomic representation. And actually we have got to the length of preparing a LaTeX um, package to help you typeset if you want to use this in your documents. And basically the idea is that the way you represent a structure should have the same degree of abstractness as what you would use when you do quantum mechanics to describe a wave function that is a vector in Hilbert space that exists and is well-defined irrespective of the basis set that you use to represent it. So basically this is a notation that is meant to separate the uh, way you represent your structure, which is uh, encoded in, uh, in the cat, and the discretization that you use to actively and practically compute these vectors, which is um, associated with indices in the bra. And then uh, uh, you will see that we use this notation with a lot of uh, flexibility, and uh, you can use uh, um, you know, specific uh, kinds of indices in the bra because you want to express how these indices relate, for instance, to your basis set expansion, but you can also just, uh, you know, clamp all of that into a single compound index, much like you would flatten an array in Fortran or Python. And the point is that these uh, Dirac notation is very useful for the same reasons why Dirac notation is useful in quantum mechanics, because it makes for a very natural notation when you want to describe linear operations. So for instance, if you want to change the basis that you use to represent your molecule, well, this is just written as a projection of your representation written on a basis X onto a basis Y and the matrix elements Y, X give you the transformation between one phase or another. If you want to build a kernel, a kernel is just a, a scalar product in its reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And uh, this is just written in a very natural way as an integral over the discretization of uh, the product of uh, the features on the two structures that are being compared by the kernel. If you build a linear regression model, once again, this is very uh, naturally written with this Dirac notation because you can write it as the integral over the discretization of this will be the linear regression weights times your uh, features that represent the structure A. So, let me now try to use this notation to show you how you can go from a representation, which is char the Cartesian coordinates, that don't fulfill most of the requirements that we ask to an effective representation to something that actually does. So the problem with the Cartesian coordinates is that if you rigidly translate your system or you swap the labeling of these two atoms, you get a different vector of Cartesian coordinates. And then your machine learning model would have to learn that actually these are just the same structure. So the first thing that we do is represent a structure as a density field. So rather than having all of your atoms tagged by their individual coordinates, we represent the entire structure as a function in uh, our cube uh, that is built by superimposing Gaussians centered on each atom. And to incorporate information on the chemistry, we just use effectively a different channel for each uh, uh, element, for each chemical species. Now, this uh, you see quite clearly, this doesn't depend on the order by which you indicate the atoms. So this is already permutation invariant, but it's not translational invariant. If you rigidly rotate your structure, this density will, will rotate rigidly, which is not a linear operation. So what you can do is uh, symmetrize this density by integrating over the translation group. 
And you can show that in order not to lose all of the information that you have, what you should do is integrate tensor products of your density. So effectively, you are already at this level computing a two-point correlation function symmetrized over translations. And then uh, what comes out as a very natural uh, side effect of this symmetrization is that your symmetrized representation can be written as a sum over representations that are centered over individual atoms. So you see that just the process of incorporating translational symmetry gives uh, as a side effect uh, an atom-centered rep representation, which is what we need uh, in order to exploit uh, additivity of the model. So effectively, we are now at the level where our structure is described by an atom-centered density built uh, of Gaussians that depend on the distances between pairs of atoms. Now, this is not rotationally invariant. So what you need to do then is to do one further symmetrization. And if you symmetrize this density over rotations, you get something which is effectively equivalent to a pair correlation function. And indeed, you can build uh, by taking tensor products of the atom center of density before you do the symmetrization, you can build a whole hierarchy of n point correlation functions that are pretty much the same that you would use in the statistical description of liquids, which is something that I really like as a, uh, you know, as a isomorphism, as an analogy. And another side effect, which is very pleasing, is that if you build a linear model on top of these uh, endpoint correlation functions, uh, what you get uh, are essentially n body uh, potentials, n body models of your atom centered energy, of your atom centered uh, property that you're trying to predict. So what you can show is actually, and you know, I don't have time to do this in a very thorough manner, but pretty much all of the representations that we had at the uh, leaves of, of, of that phylogenetic tree uh, can be re-derived as appropriate projections of these objects. And for example, uh, you can take uh, um, the translation is symmetrized uh, density and express it on a plane wave basis. And what you obtain is a, a scattering representation of crystal structure that has been used by Ziletti et al uh, as fingerprints of atomic structures. So they didn't need rotational invariance. And so this was good enough, but basically, that's just the same thing, just expressed on a different basis than these uh, two point correlation function. You can uh, project this density on a set of pair or three body uh, functions, uh, and what you obtain are the uh, atom centered uh, symmetry functions, a la Beller Parinello, which are actually also behind the uh, DeepMD scheme. And actually, my favorite uh, uh, version of this arises when you realize that you can expand the atom center density on a basis of radial functions and spherical harmonics. Because what is very nice is that spherical harmonics are a very natural object to deal with when you want to incorporate rotational symmetries. And indeed, you can show that the two-point density written in this basis is nothing but the SOAP power spectrum that has been used so successfully by Gabor Chani and collaborators over the past, uh, well, decade, essentially. And you, you see here, if you're familiar with the framework, how the notation that is usually used in SOAP papers maps onto this uh, Dirac notation. Um, and then this Dirac notation becomes useful when you want to expand uh, and extend these to higher body orders, because you can then see how all that you need to do, which is yeah, not, not necessarily trivial, but is essentially to write these uh, integral over rotations and exploit the properties of Wigner D matrices to write this integral, which is a continuous sum, as a discrete summation over the NLM expansion coefficients. And uh, a little aside that I want to 
point your attention to uh, is that even though this construction gives you um, a representation that fulfills the requirements of smoothness and uh, symmetry invariance and additivity, it doesn't necessarily grant you uh, completeness. So this is very easy to show and it has been known for quite a lot, uh, long time. Uh, if you just consider uh, two body correlation functions, uh, it's very easy to build uh, examples of structures that have the same uh, G of R essentially, but are different. And we have been able to show, thanks also mostly uh, to a extremely smart, uh, actually graduate student when he started contributing to these, uh, um, you can also build uh, counter examples that show that SOAP and also the four point equivalent of SOAP are not complete. So you can build the pairs of structures that are not equivalent, but have the same three and four uh, body representation. So this is still an open problem. How much this is relevant for actual models is a other open problem, but it's kind of a interesting. Uh, so just to say that the problem of representing structures efficiently is not yet fully solved. Uh, now, all that I discussed this far dealt with the problem of predicting properties that are invariant to symmetry operations. But if you want to describe something like a vector or more in general, a tensor, you don't want your model to be invariant to rotations. If you want to describe a vector actually General tensors can be expanded in a way that correspond to spherical harmonics, again. And so if you want to learn a component that transforms like a spherical harmonic of order lambda, what you really need is a set of features that transform under rotations like a spherical harmonic of order lambda. Because then when you build a linear model, this linear model will have naturally the rotation properties that you need to predict a tensor. And actually you can do this in the same framework of these uh, symmetrized density correlations by incorporating what is essentially a YLM, a spherical harmonic, in the integral that you need to do. You see here formally I'm doing a correlation of two, sphere, uh, two densities, uh, two atom center densities, multiplied by a spherical harmonic that provides the basis to expand a property that shall transform like a spherical harmonic. And actually, once again, this is done much more naturally, much more easily from a computational standpoint. If you expand the density on a basis of spherical harmonics, because then the object that you want to compute can be evaluated in a discrete way. And if you look at this, those of you who are familiar with the, uh, the summation rules of angular momenta will recognize that what I'm doing is basically taking two angular momenta, summing them over with a the klebsch cordon coefficient and getting an object that still transforms like a angular momentum. So something that we recently re uh, realized again, thanks to a super smart master student who is now a PhD in my group, uh, is that actually you, you can build this up and you can build a whole hierarchy of equivariants that can be obtained by summing up um, spherical invariants, and you can basically build them recursively using the uh, summation rules uh, for angular momentum. And then uh, this is also a very efficient way of computing invariants. So also if you're interested in just learning scalars, and so you say, oh, wh why are you talking about all of these uh, covariant stuff? I don't need it. Actually, this is also a very efficient and elegant way of computing uh, invariant features. So the problem that you encounter if you start doing this is that the number of features that you need to evaluate explodes uh, exponentially with the body order that you want to consider. And so what we are proposing is that you can come up with a iterative contraction scheme that we call NICE, 
uh, that basically allows you step by step, every time you increase the body order, you then subselect or contract your features so that you keep the complexity both computational and uh, in terms of number of parameters of your model under control. And you can show that this allows you to build linear models that compete in accuracy uh, and actually are better than uh, the fanciest uh, deep neural network that you can come up with. So if you have very, very good features, uh, they can actually perform better with a linear model than uh, when you use a complex nonlinear model because you have essentially much less risk of overfitting. Now, up to this point, uh, I have worked with an expansion of an atomic density and locality has been a fundamental ingredient of all of these. So in the end, you want to predict the properties of a you know, large system and uh, you are expanding it up in atom-centered contributions. So a very important question that you should be asking yourself is how local is local? And uh, so the idea is that a naive thing that you can do is try to expand, extend the cutoff radius as a convergence parameter. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't really work as well as you would expect. So what you can see here is I'm trying to build the models actually of the cohesive energy of some small organic molecules. And I'm building models using different cutoff radii. And what you can see is that if you have a small training set, a short cutoff radius works very well. And, but then uh, the accuracy of this model will saturate uh, as I increase my training set size because you can't describe anything uh, that relates to interactions that extend to more than two ohms tall. So you can increase the cutoff distance uh, and this will make your model more expensive because you need to sum over more neighbors uh, when you build it. But actually, yes, your model will be more efficient if you have a large training set size, but it's not necessarily the most efficient model. So if you have a small training set size, or if you want to extrapolate, this might not be the best model that you can use. So actually, uh, the idea of making a regression model better just by increasing the cutoff radius of your model is not only an issue for computational complexity, but also it's not necessarily the best thing that you can do in order to get uh, the best accuracy throughout the, uh, uh, the sizes of, of training sets that you could have. So one possibility is to combine multiple models as we are doing here. And the weights are effectively hyperparameters that we tune so that we reflect the importance of different length scales in determining the properties. And if you do this at the price of computing multiple models, so this is more computationally expensive, but you can beat at least the um, model complexity issue and you can get something that for these small organic molecules allows you to predict the cohesive energy with an accuracy of 0.14 kilocalories per mole, which is ridiculous because this data set is based on the free leap. And so the reference energetics is no better than one kilocalorie per mole. So we are predicting very well a reference energy, which is not very good. So the problem is that if you want to now go to a system that instead is dominated by long range interactions, let's say electrostatics, you are in for a lot of trouble because electrostatics has this very long range behavior that can lead to very paradoxically effects. So for instance, this is a typical example from something like Kittel, so an undergraduate textbook on solid state chemistry. If you try to compute the cohesive energy of an ionic system just by summing over spheres of larger and larger size or cubes of larger and larger size, uh, the two series converge to a different result. And this is a consequence of the fact that, that the series that you obtain is not, system, uh, is not uh, convergent in absolute value. And so you get all of these paradoxical effects. And the point is that if you try to use a 
local machine learning model to predict something that depends strongly on electrostatics, let's say the binding curve of two charged residues, that's never gonna work. You can see that, of course, a short range cutoff won't be able to predict the tail. And the tail is gonna have a very substantial effect. I mean, these are hard three, so, uh, oh my God, this is more than an electron volt. Uh, and this is a log scale. So you really would need to increase your cutoff to 50 Ohmstrom before you can even approach convergence of this interaction. So what we propose to do here is basically to try and keep a local representation, but one that incorporates the long range physics. So how can you do that? The idea that we are exploring is to start from this decorated atom density. So here you really see how useful is this uh, Dirac notation. Basically, we just do a non-local transformation and we transform this into a um, atom density potential, which is the electrostatic potential generated by this density. Of course, this is not a real potential because this is not a real density. And for instance, each atomic species will give rise to a different atom density potential. But the important thing is that once you symmetrize this potential, you end up with a local description. This is the potential computed around uh, just one center, but it has the proper uh, asymptotic contribution. It can be actually computed very efficiently in reciprocal space. Uh, this is basically just solving the Poisson equation. This is something that has been studied to death. And when you use this to predict something like the cohesive energy of charged molecules, you can see that even though we are only training on short range information, since we capture the correct asymptotic behavior, we get very nice extrapolation up until the fully dissociated limit. And uh, more recently, we have been playing around with a, a multi-scale family of features that basically combines local and non-local uh, features uh, in a fully equivariant symmetrized way. And what you can see is that, first of all, you have an extremely elegant uh -huh. mapping of uh, uh, sorry, somebody said something. I mean, I'm almost done. Um, so you get a very nice mapping on uh, um, long on uh, multiple electrostatics, but you can actually use these to learn all sorts of long range physics. So this also works well, for instance, uh, to learn uh, the uh, dispersive relation uh, between uh, apolar uh, residues. And, and I'm very excited about this. You can also use this to learn the interaction of a molecule with a metal surface, which is, you know, this is the most polarizable system that you can think of. And still, uh, this object gives you the function, a functional form that is flexible enough to learn this kind of physics. So with this, I just want to uh, wrap up. So we leave time for questions. Um, so overall, the message that I want to give is that representations are perhaps the most important step in the construction of machine learning model. So you should use them uh, randomly uh, or because of you know, personal history, but you should think very carefully about what it implies to choose one representation over another. Luckily for you, uh, most of the representations are actually different ways of looking at the same object. And so in the end, uh, uh, I think it's not by chance that many competing approaches uh, end up giving uh, relatively comparable performances when applied to the same uh, kind of system. But I think that one of the most uh, interesting open challenges uh, relies on, uh, well, understanding completeness and also in how to incorporate long range behavior because most of the features that are currently being used are deep down local descriptions that are built upon some kind of uh, uh, divide and conquer uh, kind of mindset. Um, finally, yeah, I just want to leave you with a few, well, want certainly to thank all the people in my group. I, 
highlighted the people who contributed most to these uh, efforts, but everyone has contributed uh, one way or another to understand uh, and to apply these to systems that pushed us to develop all of this machinery. And so thank you for your attention and I hope that you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michele, for the nice talk. So now we have time for questions. And uh, so as usual, I invite people that have questions to either write them in the chat or to just write in the chat that they want to ask it uh, uh, live. Okay, so we, we have a, a first question from Zrabani. Is it appropriate to talk about irreducible representations? Uh, so, so there are you can you can in two ways. So one is uh, um, you can speak about irreducible representations. Um, okay, let, let me go back a second. Okay, so um, there are two ways in which you can talk about irreducible representations. So if you look at this object, okay. Uh, the uh, rotational symmetries enter both in the cat and in the bra, and it means two different things. So, so in the in the cat, uh, it has to do with the representation of the target property. So if you want to describe a target property that is a certain symmetry, then you need to choose a family of features that has a certain uh, symmetry. And in this sense, it's very useful not to use Cartesian tensors but to map them, and this is something that is very well known, uh, map it onto irreducible spherical tensor representations. And then uh, you can ask yourself, uh, what is the most compact possible way uh, to represent uh, uh, features uh, with a certain set of rotational properties? And this has to do with the indices on the left side. And this is another very complicated thing. So seeing uh, these as uh, uh, elements of angular momentum is uh, super useful because you can actually use uh, um, angular momentum recoupling theory to derive what are the linear independent features. Um, but so in yeah, terms of the klebsch gordon coefficients. Uh, in terms of the klebsch gordon coefficients, actually, so it's a little bit complicated. Basically, every time you combine a new uh, um, set of spherical coefficients, uh, this might be getting a little bit too technical, but basically this is like when you sum angular momenta, it matters the order by which you sum them. And uh, you have indices that keep track of these. Um, and uh, all of this is very well understood in angular momentum theory. And you, since you can map these features on angular momentum theory, you can exploit all of these to figure out which are the linearly independent features of a certain body order. But it's a complicated, so this, this paper actually has 50 pages of SI that try to get a little bit more in depth into these. And Jigya Zanigam is really the person you want to speak to. She understands this uh, much better than I do, I think. Other questions? Don't be shy. Come on. Maybe I will ask one in the meanwhile. So uh, when do you foresee that uh, these techniques uh, will be, it will be possible to apply to these techniques to small biomolecules in water? So I, so personally, I think that one big hurdle uh, towards doing these for something like uh, solvated systems uh, um, is going to be the long range part. These far people have happily lived without long range uh, uh, interactions. And I think that Bing Ching is gonna show later uh, how you can actually get away and get very accurate results without long range. I think that most of these successes are connected with the fact of working with bulk systems. Uh, when you start, uh, you know, when you start having something like a surface, uh, I think it will be very, very hard uh, 
to, to get away with, uh, without a proper description of long range terms. Now, uh, Tristan Bero uh, and collaborators, uh, I, I mean, okay, let's, let's go in order of uh, history. So, uh, Artrit Nognuch and uh, Jörg Beller have done uh, um, perhaps the most simple thing that you could think of, which is uh, learn point charges and, and then use an uh, electrostatic model based on point charges. I think that the fact that this hasn't been used much after, even though they have done these, uh, I would say almost 10 years ago, says something about the fact that perhaps it doesn't necessarily work so well. Uh, I mean, when we tried to baseline uh, uh, with an electrostatic model, it didn't actually work so well. Uh, then uh, um, Tristan Bero has done something which is more in the direction of doing a multipole model where you learn the multipoles and build an electrostatic model with multipoles. Uh, I think that in general, on a sort of a philosophical level, uh, the issue is that uh, what's the point of doing machine learning if in the end you go back to doing models uh, that people have been doing for uh, 40 years. Uh, and my answer to that uh, is that uh, I think it's very useful to have uh, uh, a machine learning framework that reduces to these limiting models in some sense. For instance, uh, most of the stuff that we are playing around with right now reduces to time-tested uh, functional forms uh, uh, when you build a linear regression model. But then uh, you can, uh, you have more flexibility because you are not trying to make these, uh, uh, you're not trying to fit uh, multipoles, so which is always a pain because you dub, you know, if you learn multipoles of isolated molecules, uh, you have all sorts of double counting issues. So, if you use this functional form, but in the end you train to the target that you care about, which is the cohesive energy and the forces, I think that's a very promising way to, to go. But I would say five years, perhaps less. Okay, I'm taking notes. Okay, other questions or comments from the audience? There is a question from Lorenzo. So these representations depend not only on the geometry of the system, but also on its topology and therefore on the choice of the force field, which is the storage burden. Uh, what's MB and what is GB? Sorry. I don't know. Oh, megabytes. 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 Okay. okay. I oh. thought GB was me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, so it depends, it's, a, it's, it's not a question I can answer with a number. So uh, some of these stuff that we're doing now with uh, these uh, uh, nice features, uh, I know, I, I want to be honest with you, we're running on a, a custom built node with one terabyte of RAM. Um, but this is more, uh, um, so it all has to do um, with how you select your features. So the, the full set of features that you would need to compute grows exponentially with the, uh, with the basis that you're choosing. Um, but the ones that you need in practice is usually much, much, much smaller. So we need uh, a lot of RAM to quickly go through all the possible features and select the ones that we need. Uh, but once we have selected them, uh, you are speaking of, uh, uh, I would say, of the order of uh, one kilobyte per uh, uh, atomic environment. So it's not much, uh, but there is a lot of, uh, um, there is a lot in between uh, uh, an implementation that works for demonstrative purposes and uh, an implementation that you can actually deploy uh, without a special uh, 
uh, hardware and without knowing exactly what you're doing. So this is one of the things that we are actually currently working on. There is a lot of uh, implementation effort uh, to make sure that you don't need the one terabyte of RAM. There is no fundamental reason why you do, uh, but you have to be very smart in how you implement this uh, uh, body order contraction to avoid uh, that. Okay, good. So I don't see any more question in the chat. So we still have a couple of minutes. If anyone has a question, don't be shy. If nobody has questions, I have fantastic uh, five slides uh, about uh, alchemical learning, which is kind of cool. Uh, do you mm. want to? I don't know. We, 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 are, we are supposed to have a break now, so... But anyway, I mean, this is just to say that there is a lot more that you can play with. Uh, and for instance, you can play about how you represent different chemical species uh, and uh, how you, for instance, you cross the periodic table. So you can try, if you have a system with many, many, I, I focus mostly on the problem of describing uh, geometries, but if you are doing material science and so you want to work with the entire periodic table, you have a, another dimension of complexity, which is the chemical complexity. And there is a lot of very fun stuff that you can do on that front. Okay, just, just that. Okay, great. So I think we can thank Michele again, and then we will reconvene uh, in 13 minutes, so at uh, three o'clock. See you uh, in a while. See you, thank you.
Okay, good. It's uh, three o'clock. So I think we can wait maybe another minute or two that people come back from the coffee break. Okay, so maybe we can start with the second talk of this session. So the next talk will be given by Binking Cheng. So Binking made her undergraduate studies at the University of Hong Kong, and then she moved to the group of Michele Ceriotti for her PhD. Uh, that she completed a couple of years ago, and uh, sh and now she has a, a junior fellowship, uh, junior research fellowship uh, at the Trinity College uh, in uh, uh, the University of Cambridge. So apparently, she will answer to my question to Michelino about using these methods in solvated molecules. Uh, and indeed, the, the title of her talk is "Modeling Water with the Help of uh, Machine Learning." Thanks, Giovanni, and I thank all the organizers for putting this together. Uh, I too missed the coffee in Trieste very much. Um, so, uh, so before I start my talk, I just want to thank this very long list of collaborators, especially like Michelino, my PhD advisor, uh, and in particular, uh, Alex Reinhardt, uh, who might have collaborated a lot over the past two years. So modeling water with the help of machine learning. So before I begin uh, into the sort of the glorious details about the system of water, which Ali has talked extensively uh, in, the, in his wonderful talk yesterday, I want to look at the big picture and ask the question like, uh, what are we trying to achieve? And what is the biggest question that we are trying to answer here? And actually, uh, the, one of the greatest scientists of all time, Paul Dirac, who of course uh, invented the Dirac notation that has found many use uh, in various fields as well, uh, answer, gave the answer to this question almost a century ago. So as it turns out, the fundamental law for understanding of most of the materials and molecules on the planet Earth are almost completely known. The problem is really that the, so the solution to these equations are just too complex to be attained. So the solution, uh, according to Dirac, uh, the holy grail of computational physics is just to is just to develop approximate practical solutions to make the computation trackable. And with that in mind, I also, uh, with that in mind, let's look at the picture. So this is a very uh, standard uh, picture of the various 
computational tools that we are routinely employed today. We have the Schrodinger equation, which is intractable. Uh, so, and then uh, at one level below, we have the quantum Monte Carlo methods and couple cluster, which are usually of reference quality. And then the workhorse of the field is more or less a density functional theory. One can of course use empirical force fields or model force fields as, such as Leonard Jones. But in doing that, we gain a lot of uh, efficiency, but also sacrifice uh, the accuracy. And to make matter worse, when we do simulations, we're not just interested in one system at a given snapshot. We want to do uh, extensive statistical sampling. And the reason we want to do that is because uh, for, for any given system, a microstate is sort of a frozen snapshot of the state of that system, like where the atoms are, what are the velocity, and that's not enough to describe the thermodynamic state. So one of the uh, one of the most famous equations, like this one, which is actually engraved on the Boltzmann's uh, gravestone, the Boltzmann equation basically states the entropy is the Boltzmann constant times the log of the number of microstates. So that sort of uh, provides the basis of modern statistical mechanics, and of course. Um, what people don't always say is that this particular equation, which is on Boltzmann's grave, is actually wrong. Uh, because indeed, when we when we account for the microstates and when, when we do when, when we consider entropy, it's not just the sort of the uh, the number of microstates that matters, but we also need to apply the Boltzmann weighting, which is the exponential of minus the enthalpy of the system and divided by Kb. We have to do such weighting to compute uh, this relative entropy. And, and there's really this entropic part that makes the task of sampling and make the task of doing thermodynamics so difficult in atomistic simulations if you are uh, aiming for ab initio accuracy. Uh, so with that in mind, and let's go into this specific system, the system of water. So although it's a similarly very mundane, very simple system, there are many, many mysteries about water. So for example, we know water is densest at four degrees Celsius, ice floats on water, which is quite unusual because usually solids are, little, are usually a little bit denser than the liquids. It has quite high melting point, uh, very intricate nuclear quantum effects that comes from the fact that like, uh, we have a lot of hydrogen atoms, which are very light. So they can behave very much like waves rather than the classical particles. Uh, and another mystery is that uh, we know like the ambient pressure ice uh, have, uh, have two different polymorphs, the hexagonal form and the cubic form. Now we know in nature, the hexagonal form is more stable, but there hasn't been any, um, uh, any sort of accurate uh, and satisfactory explanation why this is the case. So uh, to, uh, and, and with that in mind, uh, in, in this talk, like within the 30 minutes, we will talk about how does machine learning potential help us solve this problem also with the big picture in mind, like the challenges in doing ab initio thermodynamics. And then I want to talk a little bit about locality. Like uh, Michele has talked uh, very extensively about this notion of locality or actually the lack of uh, locality in many systems. So I'll explore the extent of locality a little bit more, but more from a sort of a practitioner, uh, from an empirical point of view. Uh, and, and we talk about like several applications that has relationship to this locality. Okay, so, uh, so the starting point is that, uh, so, it, the, the, the key uh, machinery that makes this 
initial thermodynamics possible is the use of the machine learning potential. So when we're using a density functional theory, which is the workhorse of sort of uh, initial calculations these days, because it, uh, it actually consumes one sixth of all the supercomputing power worldwide, it can handle a system size of hundreds of atoms on a time scale of picoseconds. And, uh, uh, but, but the worst part is like it, it, it usually uh, has a cubic scaling that is not ideal. And, and the machine learning potential are nicely overcome these limitations and particularly on the system size, it also has a very nice linear scaling thanks to the locality, which we will discuss a little bit later as well. Now, uh, so why does machine learning potential work? Uh, so I want to just to give a very uh, intuitive uh, explanation because I'm a like a simple person and I like simple explanations without like using a direct notations. So uh, the reason how I uh, how I rationalize why this work is to think in terms of atomic environments. So if I ask you the question, like uh, we have these two systems here, and and what do you observe? And you will tell me on the left we have a amorphous system, a liquid-like system, and on the right we have a solid system. And the reason why you think this is a solid-like system on the right is because all the atomic environments uh, on the on this right configurations are very similar. And indeed, if you look very closely, you can even find very similar uh, local environments in liquid configurations as well. And moreover, you, you probably also find certain local environments in the liquid that resembles the solid. I'll also uh, delve into this point a little bit later. And what this means is that similar atomic environments are encountered in your simulations over and over again. And that's what makes initial molecular dynamics sort of a bad idea because you will encounter these atomic environments over and over again. But every time you see uh, each environment, you have to turn on the engine, you have to turn on the quantum chemistry engine, you have to solve the quantum mechanical equations over and over again. And this is a little bit of the waste. So the idea that the core uh, idea of machine learning potential is like, uh, we, we, we sort of like built a memory of uh, all the uh, sort of relevant atomic environments that we are going to encounter. And we also make this assumption, which is the locality assumption. We assume the energy and forces of each uh, environment it, it has this nearsightedness. It only depends on that small environment of a finite cutoff. And, and, and with that, we have a very simple workflow uh, for building a machine learning potential. It's basically a two-step process. Step one, we collect a bunch of relevant environments, and then we can do some interpolation uh, between them so that we get a smooth potential energy surface, right? Uh, so this is a very uh, simplistic view, uh, but of course there are many uh, algorithms to do this, but uh, in the end, uh, the performance are quite comparable uh, in my experience. So to uh, so go back to water, so what we did is that uh, we, we first select a good uh, density uh, functional that was a benchmark from AIMD simulations, uh, as well as against reference data. And then we collect uh, bulk water. Uh, these are all liquid water configurations. Like each uh, snapshot has 64 water molecules and we have about like a thousand plus configurations. 1000 comes from like quenches of classical water. And then the rest come from path integral molecular dynamic simulations. Um, and then I just show you this is sort of the standard uh, 45 degree line that all people uh, do machine learning shows. 
uh, we fit the energy and the forces for these configurations. And then we use the machine learning potential uh, to do some predictions. So the first thing we did is uh, to predict the density isobar of the ice and uh, liquid water. So, uh, so uh, first of all, the dashed lines here, the dashed lines here are the classical water. So classical ice and classical liquid water. And when I say classical, it means like the hydrogen uh, and oxygen are treated like point particles. So we don't consider nuclear quantum effects on them. Uh, and then the solar line is like when we switch on the nuclear quantum effects. And it's quite interesting because the nuclear quantum effects actually makes water a little bit denser. Now we, can, we also compare with experiments. So the stars here are from experimental data. And you can see the machine learning potential actually captures the density maximum, the four degree Celsius density maximum in liquid water. And then we, we are more or less sort of a few percent within uh, experimental era. And this type of performance is on par with the sort of the best uh, water model available. So uh, we also computed the radial distribution function. In this case, we also consider the classical as well as the quantum mechanical water. And uh, only when we switch on this nuclear quantum effects, then we get a, 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 a good agreement with experiments. Now, uh, I, I'm interested in thermodynamic properties and in particular, the chemical potential of different phases. So the standard workflow of doing this is that we start from a harmonic reference and then we do a thermodynamic uh, integration to switch that, to switch this harmonic system with the analytic free energy to our physical system. And then to go from there, we turn on nuclear quantum effects uh, to, uh, to embrace the wave-like nature of hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And I want to uh, go a little bit deeper uh, into the thermodynamic integration method. So uh, thermodynamic, thermodynamic integration is really a very sort of a broad concept. It really means that when you have two systems and then you can construct uh, either a physical or virtual path, thermodynamic path between them. And the free energy difference between these two systems can just be evaluated as that like, you go along this path and you accumulate the, inf um, the infinitesimal differences in the free energies along this path. Now, in practice, uh, we have a recipe uh, for doing this that, that works for most cases. And it basically goes like, we do a switching from uh, harmonic to a harmonic, as mentioned before, in the MVT ensemble uh, under a constant volume at low temperature. And then we make a jump to MPT ensemble to get uh, a measure of the Gibbs free energy. And then we go up in the temperature uh, to get the Gibbs free energy at the design, uh, at, at the desired temperature. Now, uh, so, so this is what we use. Uh, however, now I'm going to show you something that may make you feel a little bit uncomfortable about machine learning potential. So, I, I did this computation for the uh, chemical potential difference. So, so this is the classical chemical potential difference between cubic ice and hexagonal ice using two different fits of the machine learning potential. And here you can see the results. Okay, these are very fine numbers on, on the order of uh, uh, milli electron EV per molecule. But you see, we don't really get consistent results. Uh, in one case, this is like positive. On the other case, this is negative. Uh, this really tells us like because of various reasons, right? Because uh, perhaps it's because of the uh, errors in the fitting, like the small residue errors in the fitting, or this is maybe we didn't account for the long range effects when we construct the machine learning potential. We actually do not get the consistent answer 
when it comes to computing the very fine details of the thermodynamic properties. So how do we overcome this and, and go to the actual at the initial level? So what, what we do is that uh, if we think of the machine learning potential surface, and uh, our ground truth, which is DFT in this case, the DFT potential energy surface. What we want to do is that we want to promote our machine learning potential result at the DFT level. And, uh, and, and these are not just for one data point, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but for the many possible configurations uh, on this potential energy surface. So to put it mathematically, uh, what we are really doing is free energy perturbation. We are saying like if we write out the Gibbs free energy of the system described by DFT, and we do the same for the Gibbs free energy of the system described by the machine learning potential, we can show that the, the Gibbs free energy between them. So the correction term that we need to apply is really just a weighted uh, exponential uh, weighted exponential average of the difference uh, in potential energy uh, between uh, these two levels of theory. Uh, so we did that. It's actually much easier than we thought because the diff usually like free energy perturbation gave you very bad statistics. However, in this case, because of the machine learning potential surface and the, the DFT potential energy surface are exceedingly similar, uh, the, I, I was able to converge the difference. So I was able to converge this correction delta mu using like less than hundreds of snapshots. So we did that and you can see with these two fits of neural network potential, after we bring them, we correct them and, and promote them to the DFT level, we are getting consistent results. So this is in the end what we used. Uh, we, we, uh, so the, the in thermodynamic integration part has been talked about before, but in the end, we always promote our results uh, to the initial level. Now, uh, coming to the results. So, so this is the chemical potential difference between the hexagonal and cubic eyes. So we did the, the usual thing. We compute it at the neural network level, and then we promote the results to the, to the DFD accuracy. And in the end, we also add nuclear quantum effects. In this case, uh, surprisingly, nuclear quantum effects is quite significant in stabilizing hexagonal ice. So without it, it, it might be the case that hexagonal ice ended up being more stable. Uh, we also did it for ice and liquid water. We did an interfacial uh, pinning simulation to compute the chemical potential difference. This is also average over different proton disorder states. And we bring it to the DFT level and add nuclear quantum effects for both like D2O, which is the heavy water and H2O. And in the end, uh, the, the, the agreement with experiments is remarkable. So we are within 2% of the experimental error of the melting point uh, within 2% of the error compared with experiments. And even like the difference between the melting point of H2O and D2O are very well captured. Now, like, so, so here comes the second part of the talk about this uh, notion of locality. And I was really curious, so what is really the extent of it? Uh, and and uh, a, very, uh, a very easy thing to check since we have different fits of neural networks anyways, I was looking at like, because the first step is to uh, compute the atomic energy associated with each atomic environment. I was wondering if the atomic energies uh, for, for the same environment, but predicted by different fits of the neural networks, are they the same or are they even related? So here you see the parity bar and they are not related at all. And these are for the atomic energies of oxygen or hydrogen, right? And, and, and then I was like, maybe the molecular energy, you know, like each, uh, if I sum up the atomic energies, 
uh, of the hydrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen in each single molecule and compare this molecular energy and how it look like. Still, the correlation is very poor. Now, this, this is not a problem per se, but at the time I was exceedingly uh, interested in computing the heat conductivity from the liquid. This is like partially uh, expired by the, the, the fantastic work of Stefano Baroni uh, in CISA about heat conductivity, this very nice notion of gauge invariance and so on. So uh, the traditional way of computing the heat conductivity is from the green kubo relation, which basically says that you do a, a you do an integral of the autocorrelation function of the heat flux. Now, what's the problem here? So first of all. When you do this integration of the autocorrelation function, the green kubo says that you should integrate the time equals to infinity. In reality, this is not possible because the longer you integrate, you also accumulate this uh, Gaussian noise uh, at the long time tail. So eventually your estimate will diverge. So which means in practice, you have to set a cutoff time for this autocorrelation function, which also introduces a bias because it may have a long uh, decay tail, but you are not capturing that because you cut off to a finer time. Now, the second problem is about this definition of J. So it has this first part is the uh, atomic energy, which is not uh, and on ambivalent in this uh, machine learning potential picture. And also there's a uh, neutral forces, there's neutral force between two atoms, F, I, J. That is also poorly defined if we are looking at uh, many body potential. And, and, and then uh, suddenly uh, uh, I, I, I had a revelation. Uh, it turns out uh, you don't need green cobalt to compute the heat conductivity. Actually, I was uh, going around in Cambridge in my office and other offices, I was going around like, do you believe that you can compute heat conductivity just from a molecular dynamics trajectory without heat flux, without any energy argument, but from the empty trajectories alone? Nobody believed me at the time. But here it is. So uh, it turns out that you take, you can, uh, you have a density field uh, in space. This is actually a particle density field in space. You can take a Fourier expansion of this density field in space. Now you are getting a density uh, amplitude of this density field on each uh, wave vector k, right? Now, if you look at, if you now these. Uh, this uh, row of K actually fulfills the hydrodynamic equation. And there, and, and, and if we look at the autocorrelation function of uh, this row of K, they have two modes. So one mode, the first mode is related, uh, it's the heat mode, it's related to the uh, heat conductivity. And the second mode is because of the propagation of the sound. So uh, so basically, uh, what that means is like, the, if you solve the hydrodynamic e equation for rho, it has uh, two poles. Uh, it has two poles uh, at zero at, on the imagined axis that is related to the heat dissipation, and another one on the, uh, and another one that is uh, related to the speed of the sound and the uh, sound attenuation. So I'll, I'll skip the detailed mathematical derivation, but in the end, this is what we see. So I plot out, uh, we first did a benchmark on the leonard jones system because for the leonard jones system, there's a pairwise potential and you can use a green kubo without any problem. And so this is the autocorrelation function for the density wave. And, and you can see the simulation and the fit. Now, uh, if we look at a smaller spectrum, we can see this very uh, sort of typical two modes. One is the one at the center at zero uh, is the heat mode and the other mode uh, that related to the sound of propagation. Uh, and, and then we can extract the heat conductivity 
from different uh, values of k from different wave vector and we extrapolate this value uh, to k equal to zero which then give us the macroscopic heat conductivity so for the for Leonard Jones we can do a comparison with the green cubo and we get a perfect uh, sort of uh, parity uh, over a very wide range of thermodynamic conditions. We also did this for water, I will not go into details. Um, and uh, uh, as well as for a high pressure hydrogen system that uses a recently uh, developed machine learning potential. So we don't care what is the functional form of that potential. All I need is just a pure molecular dynamics trajectory. Now, uh, and, and now uh, I'll just very, in the next five minutes, I'll just very quickly go through uh, this other aspect of locality, extracting out ice-like local environments from liquid water. This is a very recent work. So remember like for the water training set, we only have liquid water configurations, but we were able to describe uh, hexagonal ice and cubic ice very well. And why is that? And, and can it be extend to other ice faces? So, uh, so back then, and uh, like Edgar, uh, also like Michele, uh, they have a scheme. They use a general generalized convex hull approach uh, to screen a very, very large and very big, uh, very extensive ice data set, and selected out like uh, about like fifty seven or so ice faces that are very promising. They 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 have the potential of uh, being experimentally. Uh, realize so i was like how well is our uh, so so you can uh, so they were using a sketch map to plot it you can also use a kpca map map so alex has talked about this dimensionality scheme during the talk uh, of clustering uh, yesterday so uh if we if we take these ice faces and we compare those ice faces and we plot those ice faces together with our liquid water configurations on the same map. Unsurprisingly, the PCA map are able to distinguish the ice and water faces uh, very clearly and for the obvious reason, right? They should be very different. However, if we instead not uh, visualizing the whole structure, but only the local environments, we can see the local environments that are covered in those ice faces are almost sort of included uh, by, the, uh, by the range in liquid water. This means liquid water contains these ice local environments. So what's the implication of this? The implication mean that the, the implication here is that we can train a machine learning potential only based on the liquid water configurations and use that to predict the very diverse set of ice faces. So this is what we get. We compare the density uh, predicted using the machine learning potential against the very various uh, DFT methods using different packages or different functional as well as experiments. And we get a very good agreement. And also for uh, lattice energy. And we, we even computed uh, this is super tedious, the, the vibrational density of states. Even uh, so this is for all the ice phases we have considered, that's a little bit hard to see. But if we zoom in in different phases at various uh, sort of density values, we get very good agreement for the phonon density of state. Uh, I'm almost done. So this is the last slide. And so this is something that I'm very excited about. So we are computing the initial phase diagram. So it's actually uh, mostly Alex Reinhardt, but we are computing the ice phase diagram. This is more tedious than I anticipated because of nuclear content effects and uh, we have to average differently, diff average over different proton disorder states, uh, but uh, it's looking good so far. So with that, I would like to end my talk and 
I just want to give a shout out at this uh, very new Python package that we have uh, developed. And this is a command line tool to do very simple tasks uh, related to machine learning in materials and chemistry. And thank you so much. So thank you, Bingqin. So now we have uh, time for questions or comments. As usual, just uh, type your question in the chat or just uh, write that you would like to speak and then speak. Don't be shy. Okay, there's a, a question from Strabani. What about water near an interface like that of a protein? Uh, I think it's likely not to work uh, because because of the reason you can mention, right? The, the long range effects is going to be more important because uh, in water, the long range effect is obviously important. It's a it's a sort of a polarized molecule. And the reason we are we were able to sort of safely ignore it or just simply correct for it is because in bulk water, it kind of like cancels out somehow. But when you have an interface, I don't think that would be true anymore. So I will be very cautious about it. Maybe I have a question related to this. So what about the difference in long range interactions in water and ice? So when we compute the ice phase diagram, we actually did this uh, free energy perturbation correction. So, so there I will say, yes, we do consider the long range effects. And, and surprisingly, it's not even that large. Okay, Ali would like to ask a yeah. question. Maybe so uh, yeah. thanks, Wing Ching, for a great talk. Um, I have a question that's related to uh, uh, Max's presentation this morning. Uh, where he was using, you know, uh, information from experiments as well as simulations to to build more refined models for biological systems. So you know, there's a, there's there's so much data on you know things like the variation of the dielectric constant as a function of temperature, as a function of pressure. Could one think of, and how would you, if it's possible, to reverse to come up with a machine learning model that comes that's reverse engineered from experimental data like that? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, so, so uh, two things, right? I think we, if, first of all, we are not clear if you just use ab initial, what kind of accuracy, ab initial, I mean, the hybrid DFT, what kind of accuracy are you going to achieve, right? I think to do this more refined cor correction, we need first to know what it is like without the correction. Right. And secondly, I remember like Giovanni, Giovanni Bussi has some scheme that uses this uh, sort of reweighting and this mutual information kind of scheme uh, to bring experimental insights, experimental observation. I, I think Giovanni did that for like RNA sort of system, right? But I, but, but I can see this is also applicable for water. Thanks. Okay, there's, there's another question from Ilham. Thanks a lot. Can you, can you explain why you did not use another functional like bleep instead of PB0 to model the water behavior? Uh, so back then we used rapid B0D3. Uh, this is because, so first of all, Thomas Markland has some uh, ab initial molecular dynamics paper using this particular functional to show that it works. And also Garrett Brandenburg uh, did some benchmarks against uh, diffusional Monte Carlo as well as a couple cluster data. So to show like rapid B0, D3 is a very good choice. And also I want to mention like we actually have some work in the pipeline, which is, so we have a training set of water, right? And we, you can recompute the same training set using different density functional, and then you can fit a very, without much effort, a new machine learning potential based on this new functional. So what this means is that because one can easily run various benchmarks and simulations using the machine learning potentials based on different functional, this can be a new way of 
benchmarking DFT. Okay, thanks. Then there is another question from the chat from Suman. Could you identify different phases of ice locally equally efficiently or the efficiency is different for different phases? Uh, so, 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 uh, so I, I, I would like to understand uh, uh, it a little bit more. So, in in this case, uh, so in this in, in in practice, in this case, uh, when I I think I'll switch the slides uh, to that particular one. So, in this case, uh, the we have the ice faces uh, available, and then we are projecting them on the same map. So I kind of know a priori which ones are from ice faces, which ones are from liquid water. I think if I if I didn't have that knowledge, uh, it would be quite difficult to distinguish the local environments, I would say. Of course, for bulk faces, uh, it seems to be uh, quite possible. Then Ali has another yeah. question. Yeah, so Big J, I have another question for you. So I think this observation that, um, you know, that you find fingerprints uh, of local ice-like environments in water is very interesting. Uh, it's an interesting way to characterize the fluctuations in water. Uh, just, to, just to extend and think about this even further, um, have you thought of uh, whether the same argument would hold when you introduce other impurities like ions? So, you know, if you have an ion in, in the liquid, uh, will you still be able to see those environments being created uh, through the fluctuations in water? No, I, it, have, uh, I have never tried, but I okay. think it would be very interesting uh, to, to try. Especially, mm -hmm. like, I think, I, I, because my intuition would be like, some ions, uh, they, they kind of like strengthen the, mm -hmm. the sort of the hydrogen network. Mm -hmm. right? So that might even have some effects in promote light iceness. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because you know, there's there's all this very interesting physical chemistry on uh, structure makers and breakers, and uh, it could be very interesting to to look at this. But we'll discuss this later. Okay. Other questions or comments? Don't be shy. We still have a couple of minutes. Ah, yes, there's a question. Could the overlap of the ice and water be just a result of your projection into a lower dimensional space? Yeah, I, I think it's referring to the PCA. Yeah, this is certainly possible because uh, when you do any type of dimensionality reduction, you lose information, right? So that's why we, we, we treat, so, but the interesting thing here is that the machine learning potential here we only feed it to the information coming from the liquid water. And then it predicts the property of ice faces. So I see that as a stronger argument about this like sort of this coverage of the ice-like environments. But I see this PCA map as a sort of more visual way of demonstrating like what's going on, what I'm trying to say but I view this machine learning potential, the success of the machine learning potential here as a much stronger proof. And also, by the way, uh, so a, a related point is like, so Stuart, uh, Stuart uh, Rice, I think uh, in, actually I learned this uh, after I did this work, uh, actually in the 70s or 80s, I would say. Uh, so so they, they were looking at this like oxygen, oxygen angle, you know, th this oxygen, the, the angle and, and that, that stuff. So, so their conclusion is like uh, the, the angles, the, if you do the probability distribution of angles and bonds in liquid, that covers eyes. So that's sort of like, uh, and of course that, that doesn't capture all the information of the very rich local environments as well. So there's another question also related to functionals. So Marcelo would like to know if the generated potential is sensitive to the different functionals or is it, or is not, or, or it doesn't change too much. Right, so, uh, so, so, so uh, we are, actually we are doing some work on this. Uh, and and I, th I think for now I can say like mostly on how different functional changes the behavioral phase diagram. 
uh, doesn't seem to have a major effect, but, but then we are already operating at the hybrid functional sort of run. So maybe that's why. I, I, I imagine if we just do a PBE that, that may have a major effect. Okay, good. So any more questions or comments? Again, we have a minute, don't be shy. Don't lose this opportunity. Okay, so if there are no more questions, maybe we can close the session here. So thanks to everyone, to all the speakers and to all the participants. I'm very happy as an organizer that uh, there are so many interesting questions uh, and it's a pity that uh, yeah that uh, the chair has to read all the questions uh, maybe it would be nicer to see also the faces and hear the voices of uh, uh, those asking the question but uh, anyway we have a, we are, are seeing a lot of we are hearing a lot of uh, interesting discussion today okay good so see you tomorrow morning at uh, quarter past nine as usual and uh, have a nice day everyone bye thank you ciao Ciao. Bye bye. Bye.